Industry Insider Nutshell, the show where we sail into our port of call discussing maritime history. So in today's video, of course, today, even though um, we've gotten onto this rush really, because at the time of this recording, it's the same week as the Royal Coronation, um, we're probably going to go into a little bit of a sombre topic today. But of course, we can't actually start this video with introducing, introducing, beg your pardon, Jake again. Jake, welcome Hello. back. Hello again, I'm back. <laughs> I can't keep There's... away. <laughs> no, you can't keep away, but it's always no. a pleasure to have you. Thank you. I know it's gone into a very jump with the topic as well, because today it's the anniversary of one of the ships that you really dive into a lot, as well as Britannic and Titanic, oh, and yeah. it is the Lusitania. Absolutely. I mean, um, the Lusitania has got so many parallels between Titanic and you know and and herself. It's it's impossible to be interested in the Olympic class and not be interested in Lusitania because you have to be. There's just too many parallels along the lines of, of research in Titanic. You're going to come across Lusitania, so she's hard to ignore, you know, because she's she's there, you know, and she's one of the one of the reasons why the Olympic class were built. So. You know, if it wasn't for the Lusitania and Mauritania, we wouldn't be talking about the Olympic class today. We wouldn't be talking Titanic. That's it. I mean, with the Lusitania, of course, the ship, even though she wasn't part of the White Star Line, but she's part of the Cunard Line, which mm. still runs today, the mm. Lusitania disaster is considered one of the most um, horrible like wartime disasters in yeah. maritime and British history because everyone just thinks with the Lusitania, oh, it's an American ship. No, it's British. But the reason mm. why it happened was because there were so many American passengers and it had a huge effect on of America. But mm. I know that, so I'll, we'll probably go into detail as the time goes on. So, Jake, yeah. over to you Thank now. You. <laughs> okay. Um, well, Lusitania was British. She was, uh, Cunard is a British company always has been always will be so it's not like the white star line the white star line was part owned by the imm company which was ran by jp morgan the american side so they were the parent company of the white star line where Cunard was realistically its own um own entity that it was just its own company it wasn't in partnership with anybody so it was pure british and it still is today the the reason why the lusitania and the mauritania were built was Cunard was was really falling behind. They had very small ships. I mean, you know, they had the Carpathia and you know the Avernia and the Saxonia, which are the, are the the three sisters of Cunard, you know, of Carpathia. And you know, they were very small. But because White Star Line were building bigger ships, I mean, they had the big four. Cunard needed to answer back, but they were in financial difficulty. They could not afford to build the Lusitania and Mauritania on their own. They needed support. So they turned to the Admiralty, and the Admiralty um, gave them a loan to build the Lusitania and Mauritania. And the loan was £2.6 million, and that's a lot of money in 1904. The Lusitania was, was the key was laid down in 1904. So, so you've, you're talking the early 20th century, you know, before, you know, way before Titanic, way before the Olympic and Britannic and, you know, and all those ships, they needed to catch up. They got the loan and it was going to be paid back over a 20 year period with an interest of 2.7%. That was the interest. The other thing was that the Cunard was going to be getting an annual sum of £75,000 for the running of the Lusitania and Mauritania. On top of that, they would get £68,000 the, from the Royal Mail so that they would become RMS. So that's the contract for to carry both Royal Mail and American Mail um, over, the, over the Atlantic. But there was also a catch. There was strings tied to the contract. The Admiralty wanted the ships to be built to Admiralty spe uh, specification. But as per as usual, the Cunard wanted them to go fast. Well, part of that was, yes, it was to give us a travel across the Atlantic, but it was also because the Admiralty wanted the ships to become auxiliary cruisers in the event of war. 
So they had to be built by uh, into battleship specification. The Lusitania and Mauritania didn't look the normal, everyday, you know, passenger ships. They looked very military, very battleship like because they had to be they had to be built to specification from the Admiralty. So they had to be built like battleships. They were also designed with longitude longitude um compartments, water tank compartments. Now that is all in good, but can that that can also fail the ship. And I'll go into that when we when we go into the sinking. But the top speed for these ships, the Lusitania and Mauritania, was up to 25 knots. So they could outrun a U-boat, and that's what they were designed to do, was to outrun a U-boat. They were, they were designed to be fast. But, <laughs> like I say, the Lusitania and Mauritania weren't exactly the most comfortable of ships. It came with a price. Although they were fast, they also vibrated a lot. They were built with Parsons turbine engine, you know, four turbine engines, which ran four propellers. So they were very, very fast ships. And passengers would complain that, um, especially when the Lusitania was, the Lusitania was launched. I'll go, obviously I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but we'll go back. The Lusitania was launched on uh, June the 7th, 1906. It took two years to build her. And then the Mauritania would follow. Now, Lusitania was like a guinea pig in a sense for Mauritania. It's like with the Olympic. When the Olympic was launched first, they found things on Olympic that wasn't quite working. And then they found that things that were, and they would do change things on Titanic. It was the same with the Lusitania. The Lusitania was kind of a guinea pig because she was the first one. And the other thing that the Lusitania and Mauritania would do is in in heavy seas they would dip their bows pretty pretty steeply and it would also jolt and, and make people very sick and very ill it was they can be very rough in seas you know yeah. um the other thing the lusitania was designed to do was that uh, they were they were made out of high tensile steel which was very um light steel but very strong it could be very strong steel, but it could be very light. So it kept the tonnage of the ships down. Um, the other thing they did was they, with the coal bunkers, they put them down the sides of the ship. So they just went, the, the whole length of the ship, they just went down the sides. But like as I was saying, is like the passengers would complain because they were just so uncomfortable because they would vibrate. And loose chain had to be pulled back um to take some columns out just to lessen the the vibration a little bit in fact i believe ismay's wife sailed on the lusitania and she complained mm, she complained she was overheard saying that the ships were very uncomfortable lusitania was very uncomfortable for her because of the vibrations and how she in in heavy seas that she would roll and she would dip and you know it was it was very you know, uncomfortable for passengers. So with White Star Line, what they wanted to do with the Olympic class, as we've spoken to spoken about this before, is that they would build their ships for more comfort than speed. For say if you was a first class passenger, you use these ships realistically for, to get to a business meeting in America or or even England or whatever. So it depending how important or how quickly you needed to get so if you wanted to get to america or to england quickly you would sell with cunard if you wanted to sell in comfort but you didn't really care about the the amount of time you'd spend on this ship you would sell with white star and that's how it worked and um, the other thing is um so the the lusitania and mauritania were designed by leonard peskett but they were designed they were built in separate shipyards uh, the Lusitania was built at Clydebank in Scotland, and Mauritania was built in uh, Swan Hunters in Northumberland, um, England. But they were also designed by different architects as well for their interiors. The Lusitania was designed by James Miller, and the Mauritania was designed by a um, Harold uh, Petto, I think his last name was. So that so they would also, I mean, the Lusitania was so beautiful her interiors were second to none i mean the first class even in third class just like the olympic class liners um 
third class would travel in style, in style that they'd never been accustomed to. Um, it was they were very comfortable ships in that sense. First class were um, given a, a cathedral type dining room. It was a two floor dining room. It was just the these ships were colossal as well. The Lusitania and Maritania would also have a playroom, a nursery for children, unlike the the Olympic class. Britannic would have it later on when she was designed, but for Olympic and Titanic, they never had that. So, but on the Lusitania, they did. They had a playroom for the children. And also what um, these companies were trying to do is trying to, they were trying to make second class look very appealing. They wanted people to travel second. It wasn't uncommon for a second class passenger to mix with first because they wanted them to mix. They wanted it to make appealing for first class to travel second. So they made second class just as luxurious as first class. So, you know, it, you wanted to sail with these people. You wanted to sail with these ships. They were designed by amazing men and, and clever men. Um, the other thing is the later would, be, would come the Aquitaine, which would be almost like a cousin to the Lusitania and Mauritania. She wasn't quite a sister, but she was more of a cousin. And she was also designed by Leonard Peskett. And the idea was, is you would have uh, representatives from White uh, Cunard sailing on White Star ships. Leonard Peskett actually sailed on the Olympic in August 1911, I think it was 1911. I have the I have the document and uh, I think I shared it with you, didn't I, sir? You did, um, yes. Yeah. And um, yeah, I was planning to do a future video on it as well, really. But hopefully yeah, that will be in the near future. But I, I'm definitely working on it at some point. But if I do, I'll leave a card above in the video once I've officially done it. But I'm looking absolutely. through the documents myself. Wow, it is so mind blowing. And these were the first drafts that were written by Leonard himself. And it's a yes. huge, huge rare sight to see. And it's never been seen by the public before. So that was no. a really golden, a great, well, great golden opportunity, really. Yeah. If I the term right. <laughs> these documents were not written, rewritten by somebody else. These are actually in Leonard Peskett's writing. It's never been rewritten, it's never been republished. This is the, the document. And the idea was, is, is like I said, you'd have um, sort of representatives from the, the Cunard travelling on white starships and you would have vice versa. And it, it wasn't that it was a secret. White Star knew this was happening and so did Cunard. I mean, Cunard knew that the white star was sailing on their ships and then you would have Cunard. And they would compare notes and they would actually take notes from sort of Leonard Peskett and they would take these documents seriously. They would take these recommendations seriously and they would try and improve things on each ship if something was picked up. Uh, with like Olympic, uh, Leonard Peskett picked up on there wasn't enough fans or there just wasn't enough ventilation and things like that and they improved these things. It was a great way of getting a perspective from from different companies and it, it wasn't it wasn't this uh, oh you can't steal our ideas and things like that you, you could yeah i mean more the more the merrier uh because it just it because that gave the olympic or or say the white star line or cunard um sort of the pat on the back because we're doing great you know we're doing good and we can you know work on it and improve it it was just welcomed but like i say um so you would have these these people traveling on each, each other's ships and they would be taking ideas for future ships. In 1910, uh, the Lusitania uh, came across uh, a rogue wave. And funny enough, uh, well, not funny enough, but incidentally, um, the captain at the time would be William Turner. Captain William Turner, who would later on be on the ship in the eventual sinking. Um, he would be the captain, and but he was on board. And there is a picture of this of the damage that was done to the Lusitania. But there is a picture of um, the bridge being boarded up. Uh, well, it was it had a canvas put on it because the rogue wave had pushed the bridge a little bit back. It actually altered it and pushed it back and broke all the windows and 
lucky enough, Lusitania was able to get under its own power back to be repaired, but she was damaged pretty bad. And that was in 1910. And um, But like I say, I mean, although the Lusitania and the Mauritania were uncomfortable ships in the sense of vibration, and, and the, they were very successful ships, when the war began, the although they were supposed to be in military use, they only kept Mauritania in military use. Now, the reason being is because the ships were so powerful, the Admiralty couldn't afford to keep both ships in service as auxiliary cruisers. Now, the reason being is because the Lusitania and Mauritania were very expensive ships. Now, because they were so fast, they consumed a lot of coal, and they would consume up to 1,000 tonnes a day, and that's a lot. Compared to the the, the Olympic class, because the Olympic class could would would consume up to six hundred and ninety tons a day. So what the Lusitania and Mauritania would because they, because they were just so powerful that they would consume up to a thousand tons, and the Admiralty just could not come up with a reason of why they would pay for both ships. But then again, it was the same for the Britannic, and when she was entered into war service. They, again, they could not afford to keep, or they could not dip into the bigger liners because of how expensive they would be. But then again, eventually that the Britannic would be uh, in hospital service. So the Lusitania was kept in passenger service through the war, um, kept just carrying, uh, you know, normal everyday pass uh, paying passengers, but. <laughs> That didn't stop the Admiralty playing dirt, or not dirty, but it did not stop the Admiralty from putting ammunition on these ships. Lusitania was a marked ship. She needed to be sunk. The, the, she was a target for the, the German embassy. She needed to be sunk. And don't forget that she's already registered as an auxiliary cruiser. So she was marked, and the Germans knew Oh well, they knew it wasn't. It wasn't a secret. At least it was supposed to be one. Well, I suppose it was. They were trying to keep it secret, but the Germans knew. They weren't stupid. They, they were. They were putting ammunition and gun cartridges and all sorts on the the Lusitania. In fact, during, on the final voyage, just before the Lusitania set sail, there was a a notice from the uh, German, German embassy that any ship flying the British flag will be sunk. Lusitania was at top of their, well, at least was on top of their list. And same with the Mauritania. The Mauritania would have been sunk as well. And the Mauritania was running as a troop ship, just like the Olympic. So during this, uh, during this period, there was this m message: any passengers sailing on a British ship will do so at their own risk. So the Lusitania took on at, in, in on the first of May. 1950, she took on uh, around 1,900 people, 1,962 people, passengers and crew. One of these people was uh, the theatre. I think you've covered this in a in a in, a, in another documentary, a separate documentary. Uh, theatrical producer Charles Froman, who would be famous for putting uh, Peter Pan on Broadway for the first time. Charles Froman, he had problems with ligament in his knee he it was from a fall so he walked with a stick that he called his wife and um during the voyage on the loose he wasn't really concerned charles Freeman wasn't concerned about the the u-boats or or the the fear of being sunk he never left his cabin through the voyage he used to have his meals in his cabin uh he was and he, he would host parties in his cabin but with his fellow passengers. And he would try to invite um, the captain, Captain William Turner. But Captain William Turner wasn't really the one to mix with the passengers. He kept himself to himself. He was the captain and that was his job. You know, he, he didn't, he wasn't like Captain Smith that he would mingle with the passengers. So he would decline, but he would send one of his officers or something to this party on his behalf. The other person that was sailing on the Lusitania was a lady called Rita Gillivet, a French-American actress who 
uh, was was famous, just like Dorothy Gibson on board the Titanic. After the Lusitania sinking, the uh, she would star in a film about the Lusitania sinking. I've actually seen that film. No, you haven't. I've, seen, I've, I've actually watched it. Yes, um, and it's it's an amazing film for for its time. It was so brilliantly done, and the effects and the special effects that were used was, you know, second to none. Um, but I've actually watched the movie uh, with Rita Gillivette in it. Now, Rita never learned to swim, just like Violet Jessup. She she couldn't swim. And she was frightened of these U-boats and the warnings, but it didn't prevent her from sailing. She was also travelling on the ship with her brother-in-law. Rita kept a pistol, a held pistol, in her cabin draw. The plan was, if the ship was to be sunk, that she would use this pistol to shoot herself. She would commit suicide because she was so frightened about going into the water. She's also related to an actor of today, Finn. Uh, Finn something, I can't remember his last name. He starred in Ghostbusters Afterlife. I can't remember his last name, I know it's Finn something. Finn Wolfhard? That's it, Wolfhard, yes. Oh, She's related to him. She oh. is his great, great aunt. Wow. So she's related to him. When the uh, torpedo struck the Lusitania, um, Rita joined onto the promenade with uh, with um, Charles Froman, and she remarked how how he was no there was no fear in his in his mind. It was just he was just mingling with some passengers, you know, smoking a cigar. And she said, and when the ship started to sink and, and she was about to go in with Charles, as she said, it, it was as if he was directing one of his theatres. He, he just was so calm and he said, just hang on, girl, hang on, you're going to be fine. Just hang on tight. And they went in. And uh, uh, Rita said, the, the suction from the water coming onto the deck as they went in, it sucked her out of her own shoes because of the, the, the immense suction. So she survived, she managed to survive, but she was the only one out of the group. So going back a bit, uh, the Lusitania, so U-20, I've actually got U-20's logbook from the day it sank the Lusitania. I'm going to read what it says because it's been translated into English. This is, this is from U-20, the captain. Straight ahead, the four funnels and two masts of a steamer were visible. With a course at the at a right angle, at the at, sorry as at right angles to ours, it was steering for Galley Head, coming from the south southwest. Ship is made out to be a large passenger steamer. Went to 11 a.m. and run at high speed on a course uh, covering with that of the steamer, in hopes that it would change course to starboard along the Irish coast. The steamer turned to starboard, headed for Queenstown, and thus made it possible to approach for a shot. Run at high speed till 3 p.m. In order to secure an advantage, uh, advantageous position, clear bow at a shot at 700 meters, a G torpedo was set, extraordinary heavy descent. When the, when the ship when the ship was struck, there was a heavy uh, detonation and it followed with a second explosion. Now, the, the captain of the U-boat was not un was not sure of what caused the second explosion, but it said it, it blew off the bow. Uh, sorry, it blew off the bridge. It blew the bridge completely off from its foundation. He, he also says that when they went round to, I think it was round to the, the either starboard or the stern, he could read... Lusitania and big gold letters. Although the Lusitania was carrying munitions and she was a, a, a legitimate target for the German embassy, one of the things was they broke the law in some way or another because there was what they called the cruiser rule. Now, the cruiser rule was that a U-boat had to um, fire a warning shot at the target for the passengers and crew of that ship to abandon ship safely. But the U-boat 20 fired the, uh, a torpedo at the ship without warning. 
which meant that the U-20 had broken the cruiser rule. Because of this, the nearly 1,900, well, the nearly 2,000 passengers on board that ship were in peril. Now, as soon as the ship struck the torpedo, or at least the torpedo struck the ship, the ship took on a heavy list to starboard very quickly, very quickly. And part of this was because of the design of the ship. Because of the long longitude compartments, watertight compartments, what that meant was that the ship could flood up to two compartments, unlike the Olympic class could flood up to four and the Britannic flood up to six. The Lusitania could flood up to two and she'd be completely safe. Any more than that, she'd be doomed. So what had happened with inside that ship tore that ship apart? Not either from the first explosion or the second. From this day forward, from today, we do still do not know what caused that second explosion. There has been reports that maybe the Lusitania was carrying more than what she was, well, that was in the cargo, on the cargo list. Whether she was carrying bombs or something. Because as soon as the Lusitania, when the second explosion took place, the ship lost steam pressure very quickly, which means they couldn't steer the ship. And the ship was stuck at port. The rudder was stuck at port, so she was sailing in a circle. They couldn't steer it. They couldn't control it. They couldn't even reduce its speed because it lost complete steam pressure. It was as if it was a runaway ship from, from when the second explosion took place. But there was also a lady who was on the Lusitania with her two-year-old boy. A lady, a lady called Ruth Logan, and I'm going to talk about her because this is just one of the tragic stories of Lusitania. Ruth was um, a Scottish immigrant who had uh, emigrated to New Jersey uh, in America. And um, during the First World War, uh, she her husband was called to the front and Ruth Logan was left alone with the child. So what she was going to do is go and join her family in Scotland until at least the war ended um, so that she could return to New Jersey with her husband. Um, so during the First World War, she would spend time with her family in Scotland. And she boarded the Lusitania on the 1st of May, just like everybody else did, of 1915 with her boy. And um, this, is, this is her story. Ruth Logan was returning to Scotland for the duration of the war, along with her two-year-old son, Robert. Her husband, James, had enlisted early on, had been wounded in uh, in November 1914, and by, and by May 1915 was once again at the front. Mrs. Logan was leaving their residence of one year in uh, Patterson, New Jersey, for the security of her girlhood's home. Mother and son travelled third, in third class, and Ruth Logan survived the disaster. Her account remains among the best of the few left by the third class passengers. It begins on a staircase where, at the moment of the torpedoing, the young mother was making her way to the open deck with her child, walking ahead of her so that if he missed, uh, missed a step, he would not fall over. This is her recollection. I never let him out of my sight, as I was afraid something might happen to him. There was people coming behind me, and when the shock came, we were all jolted about. I immediately seized Robert and ran on deck. The vessel had a considerable list to one side, but she righted herself for a few minutes, and several men clapped their hands and tried to reassure us that she would the ship was stay afloat. The day before the disaster, there was sports on board, and as Robert was too wee to take part in the general amusement, I took uh, took a running after him, crying as as I did so. I'll catch you, and oh, the tragedy of it all! When the rush for the life lifeboats came, Robert could could not understand it all and lisp the words I use to this day. Before everybody seemed to be running around and everybody seemed to be getting life belts. I appealed to several, but one in, in excitement, uh, he ne needed me until a sailor came along. I took him to be an officer. Wait a second, I'll get you one, he said, and immediately reappeared with a life belt, and he put it around me. I said to him, what about my child? He, and he replied, but put him along with you, 
and he and he lifted my child and put him inside the jacket, which was around me. He immediately began to struggle and wanted to to wanted down on the deck. And another sailor passing me a minute passing me a, la a minute later advised to me to put him put him till he could get into the jacket on you know put you know to the jacket was right. I asked him to get a life belt for the wee chap, and he hurried forward to get one. And that moment the ship went over. I held on to his hood, and we went down together. And and the moment the ship went over. He still had a grip of him. I still had a grip of him. When we came to the surface, the child struggles and the, the struggles of the hundreds of other others in the water at the time caused us to separate. Mrs. Logan was in the water for nearly five hours before she was picked up unconscious by, uh, by a torpedo boat around 7 p.m. She was still unconscious when she was brought ashore. Later that night, she woke in Hoddle Wayne Hundle Lane, sorry, uh, where at first she she assumed the me that 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 the, her memories of the tragedy were a horrible dream. She was able to identify her son's body in Queenstown before travelling on to Scotland. Robert Logan's body was number forty two and was buried was buried in Commons Grave in the Commons Grave grave of uh, Letter C in in the old church cemetery. So. After that, she was left alone. Her two-year-old boy drowned. And uh, she was, you know, that's the tragedy of it all. Mm. You know, that, that's not just, that's not that's just one of so many children. There was 100, 124 children on board the Lusitania that day. And only 94 of the, of the 124 children, 94 of them drowned. I mean, it's so awful when you think about it because with Ruth's story I I could feel my chest like tightening a bit and my stomach just hit drop like the floor and of course you being a dad Jake and then me working with children especially yeah. with learning disabilities as well you can't help but wonder how much you just think it's traumatic mm. in any shipwreck really and that's more children lost compared to yeah. Titanic as well. And so many children were orphaned yeah. on the Lusitania as well, like Helen Smith, if, and she was yeah. um, orphaned because out of her party, only she and her auntie survived. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it. this is what I mean. I mean, this is the tragedy of the Lusitania is that so many children died. And part of this is because, although the Lusitania had more lifeboats on her because of the Titanic disaster, Half the lifeboats became useless, and that's because the ship sank so quickly. I mean, it took just eighteen minutes for a seven hundred, nearly eight hundred ton, uh, eight hundred foot ship to founder. And this, again, as I was saying about the 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 design of the ship, is it was poorly designed. And I mean by poorly is because the the long, longitude uh, compartments, the way the, the the compartments were designed, was that if the ship took a list, you couldn't correct that list. There was no way of trimming it. So if she took a list, that's it. You couldn't. You couldn't. That's it. Because of the way the the design of the ship was, it was. It was just. It was just pointless. And also, just like on Britannic and and also Titanic, there was portals open on Lusitania, which also hastened the sinking. It was just a chain event that ended up sinking the ship. The other person that was on board the of the you know on board the Lusitania was Alfred Vanderbilt. If no one knows, has ever heard of the Vanderbilts, then you know if you haven't. Then you've been locked up somewhere. <laughs> Everyone's heard of the Vanderbilt family, and Alfred Vanderbilt was. Um, a lot of people think that he was the one that was that booked a ticket on the Titanic and never got on, and it wasn't. I, th I believe it was his brother. George. It was either his brother or his dad, George, that got that was booked to ticket on the Titanic. But Alfred couldn't swim neither. He never learned to swim. So, you know, he drowned on the Lusitania, so he didn't make it off the ship. You know, it's just tragic. And and the sad part is, is that the captain, because there'd been a the night before the sinking, uh, there'd been a concert amongst the, the the passengers and and the crew were kind of taking taking him you know just to sort of brighten up the mood because you know the war was going on and 
they just wanted to make it a little bit more comfortable for them. So they, there was a concert of singing and dancing and juggling and all that sort of thing. During the concert, the captain came down to the lounge where the concert was taking place and he addressed the passengers, specifically warning them to keep their lights off at night and everything and cigars not on deck because of torpedoes, of U-boats in the area. So only the night before, he was warning his passengers of the event of being torpedoed. And yet, the 24 hours later, well, not even le no, less than 24 hours later, the ship is sunk. It's just crazy how one minute he's warning them, the next they're actually in the middle of it all. Now, the other thing is that you could also blame the captain for the sinking of Lusitania, or partially. Would like would, he was he was liable. The reason being is because, well, there was a fog on the morning of the seventh, and the ship had to lower its speed to fifteen knots, and then sound its foghorn, which did not amuse the passengers whatsoever. Now, because to the passengers it was as if they were announcing their position or announcing to the enemy that the ship. Was near because if you know if you fog if the ship's horns going, you know, the enemy is going to hear it. So they were not amused. And um, bearing in mind, the Lusitania could reach twenty five knots. Now she's down to fifteen knots because of fog. But also because of the coal shortages during the First World War, the Lusitania could not make twenty five knots. The best she could do was maybe twenty one, twenty two. That's the best she could do. But that day, she was sailing at 18 knots. Now, the U-boat 20, now this is interesting because he marks the ship at doing, by the time he spotted the ship and he was going to torpedo it, it was doing around 22 knots. That's what he said in the in the in in his log. But actually, the ship was doing around, well, was the ship doing less? Was it doing more? There is that debate in amongst historians that of the, the actual speed the Lusitania was actually doing. The captain of the U-boat put it down as 22. People say that he lowered the uh, Captain Turner lowered the speed down to 15 knots because of the fog, and then he raised it up to 18 knots, and that's where it stayed at by the time it was torpedoed. But even then, a U-boat couldn't catch the Lusitania even at 18 knots too fast. Because U-boats can only do probably a minimum of 14 knots, maybe less, a little bit less, depending whether they're submerged or on the surface. So, you know, there is that area of, of debate of what actually, what was the speed of the ship. But Captain Turner had also brought the ship further to the coast. Now, that was all against rules because he was also blamed for not doing a zigzag. He should have been zigzagging and he wasn't. Right. The other thing was that you do not bring your ship towards the coast because you know U boats are going to be patrolling that. And incidentally, there was U 20. Now, at first, when U 20 spotted it like, it, like it said in the log, as I read out, that they didn't think they would catch it because she was going in an opposite direction. he They were hoping that they were head towards Queenstown, which is more towards the starboard, to bring it in line for a shot. And guess what? It did. And Lusitania turned 87 degrees east towards the coast because simply Captain William Turner had lost his bearings. He didn't know where he was. He thought he was further back, so he thought he had to... because. The ship has to catch the tide to get into the Mersey, go into Liverpool. That's where the ship's heading. And if it doesn't catch the tide, they're going to end up waiting for the tide to come, you know, to come in. Otherwise, it, they're going to end up stopping and they're a sitting duck. But he'd lost his bearings and he'd lost where he was. So he brought the ship closer to the coast, just the basic case bearings of where he was. Because the, the, the fog had simply, because he thought the ship was doing a lot faster than it than and they thought he was further back. But you know, but he had to try and make up the time and incidentally brought the ship towards the coast and that's where she was torpedoed. But after the sinking, um, you know, the ship took down 
close to 1200 people and when it sank it was such it was so violent uh people were sucked into the because the funnels never fell off they didn't fall off not like the titanic or the britannic and the funnels stayed on so when the funnels entered the water they they caused the suction and uh, captain william turner was on the bridge and as he was going to get off because he was he was prepared to go down with his ship he was he was on the bridge but somehow he managed to get onto the the port side wing of the of the bridge and he swam off um and he grabbed hold of um a floating deck chair that kept him afloat and he thought that the ship had been abandoned but when he turned back he saw the horror of all these people drowning and one of the things he witnessed was people being sucked into the funnels and spat out again. Yes. So he was seeing all this horror. You know, there was people fighting, screaming. It was just horrendous. Everything was horrendous. Um, you know, by, boats were smashing, boats were falling off the ship. Uh, the, the boats on the port side became completely useless. They were falling, sliding on the decks. They just couldn't get them off. I mean, only six of the 48 lifeboats on board the Lusitania managed to get off successfully. And one of them sank during its time in the Atlantic. Practically nearly everybody ended up in the water, in the freezing cold Atlantic. It took forever for rescue to come to the Lusitania's, well, the passengers of the Lusitania's rescue. It took forever. And, you know, people were brought up onto Queenstown, I mean, Queenstown is famous for, sorry, Cove now, but it's famous for one or two things. It's one, it's the last place, port of call for Titanic, but it's also the last place that, you know, where the dead bodies were brought up onto the onto the shore from the Lusitania. The Lusitania was just horrible. Now, after the sinking, the German embassy were criticised and it caused an outcry, a political outcry, I mean, German shops in British cities were being smashed, and Germans, German people in German cities, uh, British cities, were being, well, penalised and beaten up and abused because of the Lusitania sinking. Because they they were sink they, they sunk a ship that was clearly marked as a passenger ship, an innocent passenger ship, but it wasn't innocent. That's the problem. She wasn't she wasn't completely innocent because she was carrying munitions on board the ship, which the Germans didn't like. The Americans, which was uh, at the time a neutral company, it was, wasn't involved. It was realistic. It was a European war at that time. The, the Americans quite hadn't quite joined yet, but the Americans were helping the British with, um, you know, arms and ammunition, a bit like what we do with the, uh, you know, with Ukraine now, is that we're supporting them with, you know, tanks and ammunition and things. And uh, the Germans didn't like it, and the Germans needed that ship sunk because it was carrying issues. They didn't want those those arms getting to the, the, the British side of the war. They were trying to starve us out of the war. Well, starve us, really. They were trying to... It was like a blockade. That's it, a blockade. And uh, Lucy Chena was caught up in it. She was a victim in it, and... So it was those passengers. And you see, those passengers were just innocent, normal people, you know, trying to get from one from A to B. But they it was as if they were cattle ready for the slaughter. Because they painted a a, a big red mark target on the Lusitania, and those passengers were along for the ride. So look, obviously when the Lusitania sank, the uh there was a there was an admiralty uh you know, um inquest into the sinking and Lord Mersey, who had been involved in the Titanic inquiry, was was the one that was in charge of the Lusitania inquiry. There was never any blame put on Captain Turner. Captain Turner, the Admiralty wanted to blame him because Captain William Turner hadn't zigzagged. He hadn't followed Admiralty rules or or regulations or you know orders. He was supposed to zigzag, and he never did. Um, he brought the ship close to the coast, which then put the Lusitania at risk of a torpedo attack. But even then, Lord Mersey never put any blame on Captain Turner. And 
Captain William Turner would end up keeping his career as uh, a captain with the Cunard, although I'm sure he was kind of blacklisted a little bit with Cunard, um, because Cunard wanted him blamed as well, because, you know, they'd lost their flagship in his command. You know, as I say, they wanted to, there was a lot of blame being put on Captain William Turner, but he got away with it. And he would later on sail on another ship. Because a year later, he would also be torpedoed. No, sorry, two years later, he would be torpedoed again. And this time, it would be on Carpathia's sister ship, the Avernia. Captain William Turner took command of the Avernia, um, in, on, and it, she was torpedoed in the Mediterranean with him on board. Um, she was running as a troop ship, and uh, she was torpedoed on the 1st of January, 1917, on New Year's Day of all days and she sank very quickly and again he survived but after the Avernia sinking Cunard gave him a desk job he would never take command of another ship again or at least a Cunard one anyway and they gave him a desk job they put him under a desk and that was it and he stayed like that until at least 1919 when he had to retire because he had cancer Um, and William Turner lived at least until 1931 when he eventually died from the cancer um and that was the end of him you know it's 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 sad you know because it's a bit like the titanic the lusitania had this thing if it didn't get you in the sinking it would get you on later it would get you later on it was kind of like a final destination type thing it's it's tragic and now you know lusitania is forever remembered as a tragedy that should never have have happened. It should never have gone that way. Um, because, you know, the the Cunard could have easily have stopped all commercial business and kept Lusitania docked, you know, f- until at least the end of the war, because she was not needed in the war because the the Admiralty were not going to pay to keep her in the war. But they carried on using her, and and in, incidentally, they would end up on munitions. The other thing that. Lusitania and Mauritania were said to be designed with was a secret compartment where they could cat where they could actually hide ammunition. <laughs> yeah, where they could hide ammunition in the ship. So if the ship was raided by you know a U-boat or or by the Germans, if it was raided that they would never find them. But that's that's obviously I don't know whether that was actually put into the ship or it was just speculation, but. They reckon part of the Admiralty specification was that both ships were going to be designed with secret compartments where they could carry, where they could hide the bombs and ammunition or whatever. And for all we know is, was the ship carrying something in that secret compartment that exploded? Because right above where the explosion took place, there was the, or where the, the torpedo strike took place. Right above it was the steering mechanism for the steam you know the steam pressure you know the, they, they would steer because as soon as the ship took that second explosion they couldn't steer the ship they lost steam pressure so it's sad and now uh lusitania lives lies at, at 11 miles off the you know off the coast of king old head of king sail uh she's completely collapsed I mean, the most recognisable part now of the of the Lusitania is the bow. The rest of it's just completely collapsed upon itself. And it was said later on that the British used the Lusitania wreck for um, bombing. You know, uh, they, they were bombing the ship. I, when I first heard about it, I was actually disgusted by that, really, because that is yeah. really, really huge disrespect to a wreck, it is. especially that, and so- especially to especially to a. I mean, in many cases, that is probably the only monument or or grave mark that these some of the people had. I mean, because some of them would have gone down inside the ship, never made it out at all, and you know. That's their that's their grave, really. It's it's sad. It is. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, it's just unfortunate. But there's nothing we can do about it. The, the only thing we can do now is um remember it for what it was and uh to um because obviously it's like I've always said, and I've always said this to everybody, 
You cannot care about Titanic without caring about Lusitania. There's too many parallels. You know, you see, you can't, you can't forget it. Uh, there was the, uh, there was a great movie made about it called um, Lusitania: Murder of the Atlantic, and I think it was just a brilliantly made movie, and I recommend anybody watching it. There's a book out there called Dead Wake as well, uh, which is a great book on Lusitania. I would highly recommend anybody researching Lusitania because there's so many surprises and so much great information because it's like the, Lus the Lusitania is, is also a well-documented ship. So I recommend anybody going out there and taking the dive into Lusitania, literally. It's just a beautiful but tragic story. I fell in love with Lusitania from Titanic and I'll never look back, never look back. Because it's it's been a a great journey, and it's been a great journey of 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 learning about another shipwreck that's outside the the Titanic realm. And there's a game coming out actually from HFX Studios, Tom Linsky's company. Yeah, mm. um, there's a game coming out about the Lusitania where it's a a uh, virtual experience where you are able to walk the decks of the Lusitania, go inside her you know, witness the, the luxury of the ship and also experience the sinking. Um, so it's just like the Britannic game. I highly recommend when that comes out, we should definitely put a link to to Tom Linsky's website uh, because, you know, his H of it, because what they're doing is fantastic. And mm -hmm. I highly recommend when that comes out, get it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I mean, I saw the footage of it and I was completely stunned. I, I will definitely keep an eye on it. And then also mm. just to jump onto the point as well, um, yeah. there is a new memorial that is opening very, very soon on the hillside, just pointing into the direction where the wreck is. I don't know when it's opening, but I have been keeping up to date with the yeah. news. And if it does reopen, I can imagine it will be well, a popular tourist attraction. Absolutely. I mean, anybody who um, has been to the Titanic, uh, you know, museum in Belfast, I highly recommend going to the Lusitania Memorial Mu uh, Museum in Cove because, again, that is a, 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 a spectacular um, experience to go. I've never been, but I've heard people who have. I'm planning on going. Uh, obviously, COVID has slowed everything down. Obviously, everything's picking up again. But yeah, I'm definitely on. I'm definitely on. You know, on the way to getting there because I was actually supposed to go. <laughs> funny enough, with um, a dive comp a dive group who dived the Lusitania back in 2021. And I was supposed to go to the Lusitania wreck then. Unfortunately, I couldn't because at the time my family member was my brother was getting married, so I couldn't attend. But I'm, I wish I had because, you know, I would have um, certainly enjoyed myself. But I know the dive team was thinking about me when, when they did go. But, yeah, honestly, uh, anything Lusitania, especially dive, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's fantastic. It's a great story. It's a great tragic story. Um, yeah, absolutely. Just don't be afraid to dive into it. Enjoy, you know, get into it. I would highly, highly recommend it. Yeah. Um, and I'm... definitely get definitely get Tom's game. So definitely, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely think there's lots of places to recommend, lots of places to do. And then also, it might be the next thing on the list for Cove because I actually came back from Titanic Belfast. And um... now that you mention it, Jake, I actually, I'm thinking about going in now because you've got me hooked. <laughs> absolutely. Honestly, uh, it you know it, it it does me it, it, you can't not it, you have to go mm -hmm. and it's also not only that i mean they have titanic stuff there too because obviously it was the last port to call for titanic so if you want you know both titanic and lusitania then that is the place to go um they also uh raised uh three of the four propellers from lusitania one is in uh, Dallas, uh, Texas, and the other one is in Liverpool outside the Maritime Museum. So I highly recommend going to see them uh, because that is a powerful experience 
uh, in its in on itself because don't forget these were part of the ship and these were raised from the wreck so you know i mean if apart from diving 300 feet below the surface which is where lusitania lies now that's the closest you're ever going to get to the lusitania unless you're an experienced diver yeah absolutely um yeah definitely uh, it's it's Definitely on the to do list. <laughs> yeah, de de definitely to do on the maritime history to do list before, like like a bucket list or something. If that's what you oh, want. Oh, absolutely! It's 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 on. Yeah, anybody who's into maritime and uh, it's definitely on a bucket list. Absolutely. Oh yeah, I would say so. Um, but no, I mean, if anybody wants to come and ask me questions, they want answering about Lusitania or Britannic. You know, I'm sure says. Will leave my contact in the thingy uh, in the comments, you know, in the description. And you, know, anybody more than I'm approachable. I'm nice. If anybody wants to come and ask me anything, please do. I'm always happy to teach people and to talk to people. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. there are going to be so many questions. I know that with the Historic Travels group, they've been asking me lots of questions about the Lusitania recently. <laughs> so yeah. I definitely think they'll probably um, for the first place to go anyway. So I definitely Absolutely. will include Absolutely. that. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm approachable. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to speak to people if they want. Ask, you know, even if they... I'm always happy to learn new things myself too. So if someone wants to come and say, "Oh, do you know this?" You know, it's great. I, I'm I'm up for that. You know, I'm up for just a discussion. If it if it's questions, if it's just a general good chat about maritime, I'm happy. But um, yeah. that's definitely a really good video interview that we've done. Really, I know we could go on forever, Jake, but I think we'll oh, I have to leave it there. <laughs> but I, it's such a shame though, because I always enjoy you for coming on, and I think when every video comes comes to an end, I'm just like, no. <laughs> I love doing this, and I love, you know, coming on. It's like I've said before, what you're doing is amazing, and I'm happy to be a part of it. It's a great, great journey. So yeah absolutely yeah and i mean it's always a pleasure to have you jake because um it's i don't think that some parts of the history are without you really because you've helped me along the way with the research as well so i owe you a yeah. lot of thanks as always well, you're welcome you're welcome i'm always, like i said i'm always happy to help anybody um that is that is willing to to learn and think not not just that but i'm just i'm just willing to help and that's that's the sort of person i am you know i'm just that's that's just the person I am. I'm just genuinely nice, Jakey Jakey. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but yeah. um, it's definitely great as well. And we'll definitely have to have you back on for another time, especially we've got a few ideas in mind. Well, you've got a few ideas in mind, really. So we'll definitely have ideas. to have you back on again to talk about the stories of Archie Jewel, William Turner. Of course, yes, yes. Obviously, I've dived in a little bit of uh, William Turner, but not a great a load of information just a bit where he's on the lusitania and that but there is great stories about that to william turner and bartlett we need to obviously talk about charles bartlett who was yes britannic's captain and also um a few others too so yeah absolutely that'd be really really good so yeah we'll, we'll probably just leave it there and thank yeah you. I, I think it's definitely really good to have you on jake thank it's you lovely. once again and thank yeah we'll, it's always a we'll pleasure def we'll definitely have you back on soon and thank you so much for watching everybody and until then we'll see you in the next video take care bye. bye guys bye everyone if you enjoyed this episode please like and subscribe for future videos until next time this has been history inside a nutshell to passing from the dogs thank you so much for all of your support and enjoy the rest of your voyage